Thank you for staying with us. Infertility is a disease of uh, the male and female reproductive system defined by the failure to achieve a pregnancy after 12 months or more of regular unprotected sexual intercourse. It affects millions worldwide, causing emotional distress and impacting relationships. However, in some cases, it can be preventable or managed. There are several types of infertility, including primary infertility, where individuals have difficulty conceiving with no previous pregnancies, and secondary infertility, where individuals have difficulty conceiving after a previous pregnancy. Symptoms of infertility include irregular periods, painful periods, difficulty getting pregnant, and recurrent miscarriages. Diagnosis involves a medical history, physical exams, human analysis for men, ovulation testing for women, and imaging tests like ultrasound and laparoscopy. The treatment of infertility often involves in vitro fertilization, that's IVF, and other types of medically assisted reproduction. Joining us in the studio to discuss infertility is the fertility support consultant and founder, CEO of Precious Conceptions, Tony Lulu Ogumade. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to have you join us. Thank you. Nice. I don't know what you do. Nice, nice being here today. Great. Now, there are those who would wonder, uh, who would say they do not have any problems, yes. but are finding it difficult to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. What are the root causes? Okay, so, so for such a couple, it's called unexplained infertility. Mm -hmm. You really can't say what the cause is, right? Um, like you defined, it's the inability of that particular couple to get pregnant mm -hmm. after 12 months of trying. So it could be a male factor issue coming from the man or a female factor issue coming from the woman. I don't want to use the word blame mm -hmm. because they've not been able to do something together. Right. Sometimes they separate, go their ways, go their separate ways meet other partners, and spontaneously these things happen, mm. you know. So unexplained infertility is about 10% of the cases we see, mm. and then we now take each client on a case-by-case -case basis and then go into the diagnosis and see how we can help them. Mm. But the thing is, a lot of these people who go through this difficulty, this challenge, can still get pregnant mm. without IVF. Right. If, you know, the diagnosis is caught early, if they go into treatment early and they are managed, they are handheld and managed, mm. uh, you know, quickly enough. I like the word you use, handheld. Yes. And managed because uh, it, it's quite an emotional issue, mm -hmm. especially for this part of the world yes. where uh, we, we believe that a family is incomplete or a woman or man is incomplete mm -hmm. without a child. Yes. And so the emotional challenge is, is, is a huge. lot. It's huge. Right, right. <laughs> so that, that is critical. But... Ibrahim. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, you know, just like she said, in this part of the world, you know, it's a patriarchal mm -hmm. system. So they mm -hmm. always believe that everything is wrong with the woman mm -hmm. and not with the man. Not the man. I've mm -hmm. heard of a situation where the husband who was married to someone and then married to another person, the first person, you know, having delivered of different uh, babies, mm -hmm. and then the second person, they're having issues to, you know, procreate and all of that. But the lady had gone to hospital several times and they said she's fine. And the, other, the guy refuses to go to the hospital, yes. saying that I do not. When you are facing infertility, like I did, I did for 12, 13 years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Both partners should go to the hospital to get checked. Mm -hmm. So men should not continue with the habit of saying, oh, I'm fine, I'm okay. You woman, you should go and get checked. The man should even go first and check himself first. Because their own tests are cheaper and, you know, easier mm -hmm. to achieve mm -hmm. rather than pushing the blame on the woman. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so when both of them get to the hospital and they get checked, the counselors in the hospital, people like us, can counsel them and say, this is how you go about it. And there are so many help, you know, um, solutions that are, are you know, available to them. To right. use. I, I am still um, staying on the matter of yeah. the root. Yes. And uh, I want us to perhaps look in the direction of nutrition, mm -hmm. habits, yes. and all of those. Yes that could contribute to people being infertile. Mm -hmm. Right. So we, we live in a world that is full of fast everything. People want fast food and all of that. And we do not watch our habits, our lifestyle, our diet. Now you find people who smoke, who vape, who drink, 
who expose themselves to chemicals and heat and all of that, that affects infertility, especially in the man, right? It depletes the count, mm. right? And it depletes the formation of the, the sperms that are needed for um, procreation. Also for the woman, um, what she's exposed to, the kind of chemicals she allows in her body, whether she's rubbing something on her skin to lighten her complexion, mm. or whether she's applying something on, unknowingly, or the food choices you make. You know, there are some food choices that alter the estrogen levels of the woman and mm. exposes her to a, a lot of um, issues with ovulation. So you find that she's not ovulating when she's supposed to. Now, when a woman is having a period, that doesn't mean she's ovulating. Oh, There's a handshake. Yeah. But both can, can happen independent of each other, right? So mm. erroneously, people think, okay, because I'm having a, a regular flu, it means I'm ovulating. Or some will think, oh, because I'm not ovulating, I'm not, I'm, because I'm ovulating, I'm supposed to see a flu, and then it doesn't happen. You understand? So foods we eat, foods we, om foods we eat, foods we omit to eat, supplements we take, supplements we forget to take, all have a compounding effect on our ability to procreate. Now, for the woman, the major thing is for her to have good, viable eggs, for her to be able to transport the eggs and receive, you know, from the man, and for her to be able to house a baby mm. to life, to, you know, mm. to term. Those are the critical things we, mm. we look at in a woman. And if any of these areas are not functional or are deficient or are suboptimal, then getting pregnant you know, for that couple becomes um, a challenge. A challenge. Yes. So what, what are the foods that um, enhances such, all that you just broke okay. down now? And uh, what are the habits too? Yes. Because we're educating people, so, and we have limited time, so as yes. much as possible, let's yes. address issues. Okay. As we so, so we encourage people to have a balanced nutrition, balanced, balanced diet. In this it's, economy? Yes, we can. Mm. Yes, we can. It, the, the thing is, people eat a lot of starchy vegetables, you know, mm. starch, carbohydrates, right. you know, and food laden with sugar. For a lot of people, sugar does not metabolize quickly, mm. and it impacts negatively on the woman's ability to um, develop her eggs, you know. So mm. we encourage balanced diet. Have green leafy vegetables. You can grow in your, in your, you know, in your garden mm. or your balcony. Make a habit of eating regular green leafy vegetable. Mm. Um, have healthy choices. You balance your portion. You don't need anyone to tell you to measure anything. Even with your eyes, you can see. If you're, if you're, if you're used to having <clears throat> excuse me, carbohydrates like three, four times a day, you cut it down mm. and you reduce the portions. You don't expose yourself to chemicals, no smoking, no alcohol, whilst you're on this journey, both for the woman and for the man. Mm. Do you understand? And then you take supplementation. For a lot of people, vitamin D. We don't have enough sunshine, and we are in Africa. Mm. And people ask me, how? Because we live in air-conditioned rooms, we, you know, houses. We go in air-conditioned cars. We are in air-conditioned offices, and we forget to take... Yes, mm. and we forget to take, take that early morning walk, mm. 45 minutes, three, four times a day. You know, it, it adds a lot to, to our bodies, and we, mm. we become healthier, you know, for it. And, and it also helps with what is going on in our bodies in, in, achieving, in achieving conception. Mm. All right, so this has actually affected some people's mental health. Mm. Yes. So let's, how do we incorporate, you know, psychological, um, you know, maybe some sort of treatment in helping people? Because some are able to mask it and some are definitely, you know, dying as a result of this. Mm -hmm. So how do we help them in terms of their mental you know, uh, health mm -hmm. and incorporate psychological training, I mean, teachings. And all okay. That. Um, the approach to infertility management should be holistic. Mm. So you are not just looking at the couple's inability to have a child and you focus all the energy on medical treatment. Right. You look at all the other areas that infertility is affecting, like their finances, their relationships, mm -hmm. their me mental health. It's always, always compulsory for them to seek help from counsellors as early as possible and i'm emphasizing early because you know that first year when they are trying there's a lot of pressure people are looking at them month in month out you are not shooting a belly you are not and they're counting nine months for you from the day you get you know you get married to when you are supposed to have your baby so we encourage them seek counseling early as possible so that you you understand what you're going through you take informed decisions right you're not just haphazard in what you do you are deliberate and you're intentional you know what you want and there are steps to achieving it 
So step by step, the counseling will guide you. Okay, you need now you need to move from one phase to the other, and then you uh, and, and it's holistic. You know how you balance your finances, how you relate with people at home and people in in the office, for instance. How such things do not affect your productivity at work, because then you know sometimes we find out that our colleagues in the office, a lot of them are going through these challenges, but mm -hmm. they still show up at work. Mm -hmm. How does your HR, for instance, support? such people and mm. um, what what level of support do offices have for these for people, people that are going through um, such difficulty and then you know we encourage them to to have lunch and learn sessions where people can come on board and help those um, employees that are going through such challenges and you know um, help them overcome that difficult um, journey they are on at the present time. Interesting. Now, talking about finances, accessibility for treatment and affordability yes. is a major challenge. Yes, that I, want I agree. For you to, to touch on, there are those who want to go through these kinds of treatment of in vitro, mm -hmm. talking about, about, about IVF, uh, but the funds for that yes, makes it, <laughs> yes. makes it yes. difficult. Yes. And then there's also the stigma. Yes. Let's not forget, mm. uh, there are those who also look at surrogacy as yes. well. And it's, there's also the stigma yes. to all of it. So talk to us about all of the mix <laughs> with regards to this. Okay, so I understand stigma. Mm. Because like I said earlier, yeah. I was there and cool. I had my babies through surrogacy. Right. See, assisted conception, ART treatments are expensive. Mm. But we still find out that there's this chunk of people that don't need it. But because they're ignorant, nobody is talking about it. Mm. They assume that because they can't conceive, the next thing is for them to jump and go and do IVF, oh. which is expensive. Right. But when we're talking about early diagnosis and management, mm. when you get your diagnosis early enough, a lot of these conditions are still treatable. Mm. Right. You can even reverse them. You can mm. cure them. You can manage them. You have supervised care. And at the end of the day, what you will be spending on treatment will be a fraction, maybe like a 10% of what you would have spent if, if you jump into IVF. Some have a genuine case for IVF or mm. surrogacy right up. But a lot of them, it's a lot of the clients that we see who are trying to conceive is because they didn't have the information and the education early on. And then by the time they present, the woman is 35, 36, 37, and she's a clear case for IVF. Yeah. But when you have early diagnosis, things like IUI, things like ovulation tracking, you understand, things like timed intercourse, you know, testing, and mm -hmm. then knowing what to do, you know, the woman gets help, the couple gets help. But when you go into IVF, you're talking about 4 million naira as, mm -hmm. of, as of today. Mm -hmm. You know, in this, when you go into surrogacy, you're talking about 14 million naira. Is it because every time we today, talk, we always look at the government coming in and all of that. Is there yes. any kind of, um, you know, program that has been you know, brought up by the government to assist those who are having this challenge very quickly? So the AFRH, that's the Association for Fertility and Reproductive Health, have been talking to the government. Yeah. And at the last convention we had, we mentioned the need for health insurance and for government to, yeah. to cover that. To cover, right. it, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, a significant part of this in, in the health insurance scheme. And it's a laudable thing. If, you know, if, we, if we're able to achieve that, that would be fantastic. Because for a lot of people, they are not able to afford that care. Mm. The first level care, they're not even able to afford, mm. which is basic things like testing, like even going for follicular tracking and, and ovulation. Imaging. And yeah, and imaging and things like that. But if we have this in our health insurance scheme, incorporated with the HMOs and in the National Health Insurance Scheme, a lot of people will have access. Now, there will be restrictions, just mm. like in any insurance policy. Right. That's right. Yes, but a lot of people will still be able to One have last care. question I wanted to ask you, which is something I mentioned earlier, was stigma. Yes. Mm -hmm. How were you able to deal with that? And what do you counsel people when they are going through those okay. challenges? So I always start from this definition. Shame comes from your, perspective, uh, your perception of mm -hmm. a, a loss. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Of your inability to do something. That's where shame stems from. Mm -hmm. But when you know that there's no reason to be ashamed, infertility is a disease. It's just like any other illness and that can happen to anyone. Fault, yeah. And it's not always your fault. Now, in, in, in the olden days, people tag um, infertility and promiscuity together. Mm. It's right. not. Mm. 
you understand? So when you have a perception of shame, you start to stigmatize yourself before other people stigmatize you. Mm -hmm. Now, the way to get rid of that is education and awareness, counseling. So before people talk to you about whatever it is you're going through, you open your mouth and say it yourself. <laughs> I'm expecting a child. Mm -hmm. It's not happening yet. Mm -hmm. And you own it with your chest. There's mm -hmm. no reason to be ashamed, mm -hmm. you know, because, I mean, it's a disease. Anybody mm -hmm. can be afflicted with That's it. Right. And so the word we always put out is, when you find people who are struggling to achieve something as public as having a child, support them. Right. Don't right. stigmatize and help with the right education and counsel that they need. So we reduce stigmatization with effective advocacy, education, mm. and awareness. All right. Brilliant. That's a fine place to leave this conversation. We must uh, thank you, uh, Fertility Support Consultant and Founder, CEO of Precious Conceptions, Tony Lulu Ogumade, for your time on the program. Thank you. For thank you so me. much. All right. Finally, we went to the streets to ask Nigerians this question. Should a child be taught their native language? Let's hear their response.